On behalf of Cottage Health, I'd like to welcome you to our joint replacement seminar. My name is Barbara Irvin and I'm an RN in the preoperative area. Here at Cottage Health, we're very proud of the fact that we are certified for total knee and total hip replacements by the Joint Commission. That and many other distinctions can help you rest assured that you're in very good hands. So here is a picture of Santa Barbara Cottage and um, their new wings. And here is Goleta Valley Cottage Hospital. Orthopedic surgeries are done at both Santa Barbara Cottage and Goleta Valley Cottage, and your surgeon will be directing you to one of these hospitals. The objectives of this class are to prepare you for a successful joint replacement, what to expect in the hospital, how to safely prepare your home for when you do go home, and what to expect in the recovery period after your hospitalization. For more information, you can visit the website at cottagehealth.org ortho. I have two x-rays here. One shows the anatomy of a nice healthy hip, the nice smooth edges of the femur and the socket that it fits into in your pelvis. The second slide shows one that has some damage. The edges of the bones are irregular. And if you look closely, you'll notice that the femur is actually jammed into the hip bone. You've lost your cartilage. This is what people refer to as bone on bone, and this can be very painful. And it's usually what drives you to go to an orthopedic surgeon. Here we have a nice healthy knee on one side, with the nice smooth edges of the bone, the cartilage is there. This is a painless knee. In comparison to the next picture that shows, of course, again, the, you've lost your cartilage, it's bone on bone again, and this is a painful knee. All of this can lead to a loss of mobility and pain. The usual cause of this is arthritis, the three most common we see, osteoarthritis. You know, everybody has a little of that as we get older, we age, things hurt. That's normal, but it gets worse. Rheumatoid arthritis is the synovial joints become inflamed and you lose the cartilage. Post-traumatic arthritis, if you've ever had an injury to your knee or your hip, usually when you're younger. And over the years, you wear the joint down and you have more problems later on in life. So what is a total hip replacement? A total hip replacement replaces the damaged ends of the bones to create a new joint surfaces and replace the cartilage with new joint material. Your surgeon will decide, depending on your height, your weight, your sex, your activity level, your age, they will make the decision on what works the best for you. These are a couple of pictures of hip replacements. And if you notice, one appears to have a screw. Not all of them are screwed in. There's some of them are cemented. And as I said, your surgeon will make the decision on which will work the best for you. So what is a total knee replacement? A total knee replacement replaces the damaged bones and creates a new joint surface. The ends of the damaged thigh and lower leg, the shin bone, and the kneecap are replaced with artificial surfaces lined with metal and plastic. Usually the entire surface at the end of the thigh and the lower leg bone is replaced. Knee joint components are usually secured to the bones with cement. Here you can see two x-rays of completed knee replacements. The one on the left is showing the lateral side, looking at from the side. And as you can see, it looks more like a lining. Um, you haven't lost as much as it, you think you might of the bone. Whereas the one on the right looks a little more formidable, but it is the same basic picture. It's just looking straight on. So how do you prepare for your surgery once you've made the surgery date? You need to obtain medical clearance from your primary care doctor and or any specialist. If you see a pulmonologist, a cardiologist, you need to be in the best health possible before this surgery. You need to complete all dental work within four weeks of your surgery. If you have an emergency and need to have some dental work, please check with your surgeon. You need to attend or watch a joint replacement seminar. We also want you to have what's called a MRSA, the methicillin resistant staph aureus screen, which is a nasal swab. It's no big deal, but it would let us know if you are colonizing the methicillin-resistant staph aureus in your nasal passages. 
If you test positive for MRSA, then you would just be on an antibiotic ointment that you put inside your nose for five days before surgery. You need to attend a preoperative screening at the hospital where you will be having your surgery. This can take an hour to two hours, so plan appropriately, please. And just thinking ahead, it's a good idea to make a plan for who can help you for post-operative care when you are home. For your hospital preoperative screening appointment, the first person you'll probably meet with is the financial advisor, the admissions clerk. This is where you will need to bring your insurance cards, a photo ID. If you have an advanced directive or a five wishes, we'd like you to bring that. We will make a copy of the advanced directive and it'll be available across all cottage health facilities. You will meet with a registered nurse. He or she will go over your health history. We need a list of your medications along with the dosages and we will be telling you which medications you may or may not take the day of surgery. We also need a list of your allergies and the reactions you may have experienced with them. If you are taking a blood thinning medication, you need to stop it ahead of surgery and depending on which blood thinner you're on, the timing is different. Your cardiologist or whoever prescribed it will let you know when to stop it. And during this visit, you may be meeting with physical therapy, respiratory therapy, case manager who will be discussing discharge planning for you, and also dietary. My name is Maureen Tykowski. I'm a physical therapist. I work at Cottage Health. I'm going to speak briefly about exercise before your surgery. It's important to be in the best possible shape prior to your surgery. This will improve your outcome and speed up your recovery. I'd like to encourage you to start a weight reduction program and an exercise program. Even if started immediately before surgery, both will help shorten your recovery. I'd like you to think about doing a low impact cardiovascular program like walking, biking, swimming. I usually try to use pain as your guideline. So if your pain is less than a four, so meaning a one, two, three, with one being no pain and 10 being the most pain you could tolerate, um, let that be your guideline. If the activity becomes too painful, I would recommend stopping it. But if you can do that in a less than four pain tolerance, I encourage you to keep doing those activities. Also, there are some light strengthening exercises that you could do for your leg. And in the back of your total joint replacement booklet, um, they're, ref they're referenced. And they're both exercises for a total hip and a total knee back there. Uh, those are basic. You can start them before the exercises, and we will begin doing those post-op. My name is Sally Greenbaum. I'm an occupational therapist for Cottage Health. And I'm going to talk about preparing your home before your total joint surgery. There are several things you can do to help get your home ready and make it safe for you for when you get home after your surgery. The first thing you can do is to clean your house before you come home so it's all ready. You don't have to worry about that when you get home. You want to place items that you use often within easy reach. So things um, on your kitchen counters or um, on your sink so that you can reach things and don't have to go digging down into your cabinets for things. You want to remove throw rugs or loose carpets to prevent tripping hazards. You want to install night lights on pathways, um, especially to the bathroom at night. You want to reroute any electrical cords or phone cords that run across the floor, tape them down or move them up against the wall. You want to keep a cell phone with you in your pocket um, at all times when you're home in case you need to reach anybody. Ahead of time, if you can get a raised toilet seat or a commode to put on top of your toilet, to follow your um, precautions after your surgery, especially if you're having a hip um, replacement, and you'll hear more about the precautions later in the presentation. Uh, you want to uh, install grab bars in your shower or tub or by your toilet to make it easier to get and easier and safer to get up and down. And you want to consider preparing meals ahead of time, putting them in the freezer so they're easier to. Um, warm up and uh, you don't have to spend as much time with that after your surgery. There is a place here in Santa Barbara called the Visiting Nurse Association Loan Closet where you can get things like a commode and a walker and a shower seat before your surgery 
Uh, so you have that all ready for you after your surgery and don't have to worry about it then. They're very nice about letting you borrow these uh, pieces of equipment and then returning them when you're done. And it makes it much easier. You don't have to bill your insurance companies and things like that. I'm Samin. I'm one of the dietitians here at Cottage Health. And I'll be talking to you a little bit about nutrition before your surgery and also a little bit after surgery to maximize your healing and the whole healing process. I have a lot of patients that say, I, I can't wait to have the surgery because then I'm going to make all these changes. Our whole thesis here would be to start those healthy habits before your surgery. Uh, so what are you going to do? You're going to start um, to at least make sure you're including some colorful vegetables, uh, which have the most phytochemicals. Phytochemicals act to protect our body, mainly as antioxidants, um, so that you have those on a daily basis. Um, you have yogurt up there. It doesn't mean that you have to go out and buy all the yogurt in the world if you hate yogurt. It just means it's triggered for your mind, again, to include it on a daily basis if you do like it. Uh, yogurt has some good active probiotics that will promote a healthy gut. Protein is up there on the slides uh, just as a trigger because if I have any kind of a surgery, I'm going to have slightly higher protein needs no matter what kind of surgery it is. So again, you're not having a steak every meal. Um, it just means a very small portion would do a lot to kind of promote that healing process with the protein and the rebuilding. Now I have a note up here about being overweight where even a five pound weight loss would be helpful. Again, I have a lot of patients that say, I can't wait to have surgery because I'm, I'm gonna lose 20 pounds. So even if you lose five pounds before surgery, if that is part of your overall goal with between you and your physician, even that is really helpful for the healing process, especially if you're having knee surgery. But what is part of a healthy diet? What do I need to include? Something to make sure I'm having would be things like calcium and protein and fiber uh, in my diet. So you have examples of foods next to each uh, nutrient. Um, now, I by no means recommend going out and buying supplements that are non-food related, but you can definitely include food um, items related to each nutrient. So if I'm having, if I'm trying to have more calcium, um, let's say I don't want any dairy in my diet, I'm lactose intolerant, there's other foods that have calcium in them. There's vegetables, there's beans, there's fish that has a little bit of calcium. So it doesn't mean that it's just a calcium supplement or milk, there's different options. Uh, for protein, you, if we're all really good at getting our protein intake usually, so um, any kind of a fish, meat, eggs, of course, but there's also some, some very good vegetarian sources. A complete protein would be any kind of a beans and rice or lentils and rice, so there's definitely vegetarian options there too. Now, if I do have vegetarian options for the first two nutrients listed, I'd be really good at getting my third nutrient, which is the fiber. So fiber is not a digestible carbohydrate, but it's really helpful, especially during surgery, because you might be on pain medications and um, not having bowel movements regularly. So it's really helpful to have the fiber and to make sure you're having adequate amounts of liquid with the fiber, because if I have all these salads and so much fiber in my diet without the liquids, then I'm actually going to get constipated as going to go the opposite way. So what about after surgery? Nutrition after surgery um, is going to continue on this same theme of having an overall healthy diet, but initially when you're in the hospital, um, the first diet you have is not really like a diet, it's more like a fake diet. You have uh, clear liquids, you have jello, you have broth. The only purpose is that is to make sure you're keeping something down before we give you steak and chicken and all this solid food. So that would be your first meal, and after that you're advanced to a solid diet, whatever that may be. Now, if you're you're a person with diabetes, it's even more important for your um, blood sugar to be controlled because any kind of a surgery is going to spike blood sugars for all people, even without diabetes. So if I do have diabetes, I'm going to want to make sure to really pay attention to my uh, sugar sweetened beverages, my juices, my uh, sweets and my desserts. So that's something to keep in mind to make sure you're really keeping uh, track of the blood sugar levels because they are going to be higher after surgery. Um, it's part of our inflammatory response. Blood sugars are going to be higher naturally. Uh, your appetite might not be the best right after surgery. So 
you might actually want a snack on all the cookies and pies and lemonade, which are definitely what I just said to limit. So it's not always a hard and fast rule of where you're supposed to land, but if your appetite isn't very good, we always have snacks um, that you can have between your meals. It's always nice to have the smaller frequent meals if you feel like your appetite isn't up to par. Much better and much less intimidating than seeing a lot of food at one time. So that's always available wherever you have your surgery. There's also a note about avoiding foods that are higher in saturated fats, um, again, added sugars. That's, again, just a note about a general healthy selection. It might be a little bit more important after your surgery, but it's still part of the same theme. And also there's a note about alcohol. So you're, not, you're gonna wanna avoid alcohol, um, especially because it interacts with a lot of medications and your liver is the one that processes all of that alcohol in addition to the medication. So it's just extra hard on your liver. So you're gonna wanna avoid the alcohol. So what can you expect before your procedure? The day before surgery, we want you to stay hydrated. You need to drink plenty of fluids unless you have a fluid restriction. Also, I know you're not gonna be eating the next day for a while, but please do not eat a large dinner. A light supper would be okay, but I'll tell you it's gonna sit on your stomach all night long and you may regret it the next day. The night before surgery. Do not eat or drink anything after midnight. If you do, your surgery may have to be canceled or postponed. Take only the medications the nurse has told you to take in the morning and only with a sip or two of water. If you need to drink more water or you have to have it with food, then we do not want you to take it. The night before, shower with an antiseptic antimicrobial soap. There is Hibiclins is available over the counter. Um, if all else fails, a antibacterial soap will work too. And this is to cut down on the bacteria on your skin before surgery. And it is not used just on your hip or your knee. I suggest you use it from the neck down, not in the genital area, and rinse well after using. On the day of your surgery, here's what you can expect. I want you to bring a case if you wear glasses or contacts or hearing aids a copy of your advanced directive, and insurance cards and a photo ID. Personal care items, toothbrush, toothpaste, chapstick. We have many of these things here, but if there's something you would prefer to use, go ahead and bring it with you. We want you to bring a pair of comfortable, non-skid shoes. We don't like you to be wearing um, flip-flops or shoes that don't have a back to them. If all else fails, we have the socks with the non-skid bottoms. Because physical therapy and occupational therapy will be helping you get dressed, it's important to bring clothes for you to change into. But keep in mind, you are a little limited in your range of motion, so something loose would be better than something tight. If you have a CPAP machine, you will need to bring that too. Eye drops and inhalers, we do want you to bring those. Those are usually the only medications we ask you to bring and we will label them for you and they will be available for your use to be continued here in the hospital. Please do not bring any valuables, no jewelry, no cash, but I do suggest a cell phone. If you're like me, I don't know anybody's phone numbers anymore and um, because they're all in my memory on my phone. So that might be something if you do use one to bring with you. Go ahead and brush your teeth, rinse your mouth out, just don't swallow the water. Wear loose, comfortable clothes, and that can be what you're gonna be changing into afterwards when physical therapy and occupational therapy help you get up and get dressed. Parking here at Goleta Valley, we have valet parking, and you may use that, or otherwise the parking lot is across the street, closer to the corner of Hollister and Patterson. At Santa Barbara Cottage, they have valet parking also, or you can use the parking structure, which is on the corner of Pueblo and Castillo, and your parking stub can be validated when you enter the hospital. And here's what you can expect on the admission process the day of surgery. When you come in, the greeter will direct you to the department you will be going to. We suggest you limit your family members. The areas are small. We have a lot of things we need to do. So we usually suggest only one or two family members with you. 
We will have you take all your clothes off and we will give you a gown to put on and we do have warm blankets to keep you comfy. You will sign a consent for surgery. You will also sign what's called a fall precaution. If you agree to it, you could sign the consent for a blood transfusion. And if you are having a knee replacement, you may be signing another consent for the anesthesiologist to do your nerve block, and that'll be discussed later. The nurse will listen to your heart and lungs preoperatively. We'll start an intravenous. We may be starting antibiotics while you're in the preoperative area. And if you have any questions, you can ask the preoperative nurse. If we're unable to answer it, we may have to have you talk to your anesthesiologist or to your surgeon. We will also verify your allergies. Everyone's going to ask what side we're doing, what we're doing, what's your name, what's your birth date, and we're all just double, triple checking that we're doing the correct procedure on you. Now, before you go into the operating room, these are some things you should know. No family, of course, is allowed in the operating room. Your family can wait in the surgical waiting room or they can go home and the surgeon can call them there. Your surgeon will be in to talk to you and he or she will mark your surgical leg. Another safety measure, your operating room nurse will come to talk to you regarding the details of your surgery, correct procedure, correct site, correct surgeon. Your anesthesiologist will also be in to assess your heart and lungs and they will discuss pain management for during surgery, after surgery, the type of anesthetic, and if you're having a knee replacement, they will discuss a nerve block with you. So this is what you can expect to happen immediately after the surgery. You will go to the post-anesthesia care unit, PACU. Of course, no visitors are allowed there. You're gonna be watched by the recovery room nurses and you will have your vital signs taken frequently. You may have some x-rays done. You will be receiving oxygen through either the little nasal prongs or a mask until you're more awake. We want you to be comfortable after surgery. And a big part of helping you with that is being medicated for pain. You will not be pain free after surgery. We want you to be comfortable and be able to do your necessary recovery activities. You will be asked to rate your pain, 10 of course being the worst possible pain you could ever imagine, zero being no pain at all. And we're going to ask you what your goal for pain relief. Zero is not a realistic goal, maybe three or four, just be aware, we will give you as much medication as long as you're breathing well and as long as it's safe. Your first medications will be through the intravenous, but we will want to transition you to pain pills so we'll know what will work for you for when you do go home. Hi, my name is Melissa Ortiz and I'm a registered nurse on the medical surgical floor at Cottage Health. You will be in the hospital after your surgery for approximately one to three days. Knees usually stay longer than the hips. You'll be cared for by a joint replacement team, which consists of your surgeon, a registered nurse, a patient care technician or PCT. Um, we may also refer to them as the nurse's aide or the nurse's assistant your physical therapist, an occupational therapist if ordered. A respiratory therapist will be involved with your care, usually only during the first day while you're requiring oxygen, unless you have a history of asthma or some other breathing issues. A case manager or a discharge planner, um, a dietitian. You may see a dietitian, especially if you have diabetes um, or special diet needs, if you're lactose intolerant, and that is something that can always be requested to um, see a dietitian. We have spiritual care staff that may come in and see you, and they are also available upon request. Painting a post-operative picture. Initially, your vital signs will be taken every hour for the first four to six hours. So very often, you will come back with oxygen through a nasal cannula, which is a plastic tube with prongs that go in your nose. You will have an intravenous access or an IV. We will give you IV fluids through that and pain medication initially, as well as antibiotics. A Foley catheter is a tube that is placed in your bladder during surgery and that's to drain urine. 
If that's ordered for you or you come back with a Foley catheter, that will be coming out early in the morning, the day after your surgery. You um, may come back wearing compression stockings or TED hose. They're like tights. They go from your feet up to your mid-thigh. Those are to assist with swelling. If the doctor orders that for you, we'll want you to continue to wear those for most of the day for about two weeks after your surgery. You will also come back with pneumatic compression devices, which are leg wraps. We wrap those around your calves and air pumps into them intermittently, promoting circulation. You will be shown how to use an incentive spirometer, also known as a Voldyne. Respiratory therapy or nursing will show you how to use this initially, and I will show you on the next slide how that works. You will have stitches or staples covered with steri strips and a bandage over top. If you're having a knee replacement, usually there are one to two ACE wraps over top of the bandage as well. You may have a drain at the surgical site, and there will also be ice. We'll either place an ice bag near your incision, or you may have a polar ice machine, which is just like a little ice pad that we place to the site. So this is a picture of the incentive spirometer, also known as a Voldyne. The staff will be encouraging you to use it 10 times an hour while you're awake in the hospital. We won't be waking you up in the middle of the night to do this, um, but it's something you can do on your own and should be proactive about. And you can continue to use this at home. Um, we usually suggest using it four times a day for about two weeks after surgery. After that, please throw it away as moisture will build up in the machine um, so bacteria can get in there. So throw it away after two weeks. In the picture, you can see by using this device, if you use it correctly, it gets oxygen to the bases of your lungs, therefore preventing pneumonia. So the routines on the medical surgical floor. We are gonna get you up early every morning. It will usually be the phlebotomist, someone from the lab that comes in to do blood draws. The doctors come in early in the morning and they want to see if you've had blood loss, if you're showing any signs of infection, your bleeding times and any electrolyte imbalances. So that's why that needs to be done early. Physical therapy is going to be seeing you twice a day while you're in the hospital. And of course, this is starting the day of your surgery. Occupational therapy, if ordered, usually sees you daily. We want everyone to be turning and changing positions often to promote circulation and help prevent skin breakdown or prevent pressure ulcers. We can assist you to turn on your non-surgical side, but you can also make slight adjustments or change in position on your own. Bathing and showering, every surgeon orders or has different orders in regards to bathing and showering. You may shower if it's ordered the second day after your surgery. If not, you can start in five to seven days after your surgery and we'll let you know upon discharge. We'll put it in your instructions. After the five to seven days when you're allowed to shower, you want to try to shower at least every other day to keep your incision clean, which helps prevent infections. We don't have um, official visiting hours. However, we do ask that you um, ask your friends or neighbors to come between the hours of 2 and 8 p.m. After 8 p.m. is quiet time, and in the morning it's very busy. Doctors, physical therapists, maybe students, nursing students are there. So the majority of visitors, it's great if they could come between 2 and 8. But of course, your significant other or you know, um, close family members can come whenever they would like. Blood transfusions, we are hardly using blood transfusions anymore partially because they are getting better at doing the surgery and there is less blood loss. If this is something you're interested in um, donating your own blood, getting autologous blood, just know it's something that needs to be done several weeks in advance. Bowel function, cannot stress this enough. After surgery, the most common side effect of 
your pain medication, the anesthesia, immobility is constipation. So while you're in the hospital, you will be on a cottage bowel program where we will be giving you stool softeners, possibly laxatives. We will be giving you something every evening and morning to help with that. And your doctor may also order a stool softener for you when you go home. If you know something works for you that you normally use at home, milk and magnesia, colace, something over the counter, or um, just a special drink or tea, make sure you have that at home and um, use it until you are regular with bowel movements. Now we're gonna talk about the therapy that you can expect after your surgery. A physical therapist or nursing will get you up the day of surgery. We're at least going to get you out of bed and we may take you for a walk at your bedside or if able, out into the hallway. The physical therapist is going to work on how to safely and properly move, including getting in and out of bed, transferring and walking. We're gonna teach you how to use a walker or crutches. We're gonna implement exercises to help um, regain your strength and your mobility back of your joint. So um, an occupational therapist will start working with you most often day after surgery, post-op day one. Occasionally they'll see you the day of surgery, but most likely post-op day one. And the occupational therapists are the people that will work with you to help get you back to independence and doing your daily living skills. Relearning how to get dressed following your precautions, um, your new precautions after your surgery. We have things, adaptive equipment and things like that to help you maintain your independence um, doing these tasks. We will work on um, mobility in the bathroom, getting up and down from the toilet, in and out of the shower or tub, and talk with you about durable medical equipment like a commode or tub seat or shower seat that will increase your safety and independence in the home. We will also work on things like uh, standing at the sink and doing your grooming, brushing your teeth, shaving, those kinds of things. And we will also talk about uh, getting in and out of the car following your new precautions. Keys to rapid recovery. We'd like you to get out of bed often and regularly. We'd like you to get out of bed for each and every meal. We want you to dress, we call it dress for success. You have to realize that you're not sick, you're just recovering from a total joint surgery and putting on clothes will make you feel um, more like yourself and able to be more active in activities. We want you to be use your pain medication to participate in therapy. It's not only important that you're comfortable at rest, but we want you to be comfortable with activity. So it's important to take your pain medication when the nurses offer it and not just rate your pain at rest, but what you might be will be with activity. And we keep moving. We want you to walk, walk, and then walk some more. Keep using that joint and you'll have the best recovery. Blood thinning, or as it is also known, anticoagulation. You will be on a blood thinner after surgery to help prevent blood clots. You may be on aspirin, which would be 325 milligrams orally twice a day, or maybe your surgeon will order Xarelto, which the usual dose of that is 10 milligrams once daily. These are the most common blood thinners. If you have a cardiac history or a history of blood clots, your surgeon may order Lovenox or Coumadin for you. Lovenox is a subcutaneous shot that you have to give it yourself in the abdomen once or twice daily. And Coumadin is just a pill taken once daily, usually with dinner. If you are already taking a blood thinner like Lovenox or Coumadin, that will be resumed after surgery. It's critical that you take your blood thinner as directed for as long as it's prescribed to prevent blood clots. It's also important while you're on your blood thinner to avoid anti-inflammatories like Advil, ibuprofen, things like that because you don't want your blood to get too thin. Pain management after surgery. Most of the surgeons are using a multimodal approach. Multimodal just means administering two medications at the same time that have different mechanisms of action and they each help each other to work better. 
Um, for example, we might give you Tylenol IV. We may also give you some Celebrex, which is an anti-inflammatory that helps with pain management, or something like Lyrica, which helps with nerve pain. By giving you these three different medications, we find patients are having better pain management, and they're also using less narcotics with this approach. Some of the surgeons will use regional anesthesia, which they give during surgery, something like a local. IV pain medications we give initially, usually the first day right after surgery. Common IV pain medications are morphine, Dilaudid, Toradol. And then we transition to you to pills by mouth once you're able to tolerate eating and fluids. Common oral pain medications are Norco, Percocet, Tramadol. So these are some of the medications you will see. Let your surgeon know what you're taking before surgery. Let them know what works for you, what doesn't work for you. If you are having a knee replacement, you may also have a continuous peripheral nerve block. This is where a catheter is inserted, usually to your thigh or your inner groin area, and it gives a medication that is, um, they use ropivacaine, and it's kind of like a numbing agent, something like similar to when you're at the dentist, when they use what they use to numb you. If your pain is not controlled by the medications that are ordered for you, please let your nurse know so we can contact the surgeon and come up with a different plan or see if there's any other options. And of course, always tell your nurse if you're having pain, please do not wait. It's harder to play catch up. Um, also do know for the oral pain medications, they do take about 30 to 45 minutes to work. So as soon as you're having pain, let your nurse know so we can give that pain medication to you right away. Potential complications after joint replacement surgery, blood clots. Signs and symptoms of a blood clot are pain and tenderness in your calf area and warmth and or redness. And of course, swelling, swelling in that leg that's not lessened when you elevate your leg high on pillows. If you show any of these signs or symptoms, let your nurse know. We'll be looking out for these signs while you're in the hospital and we can get a, a scan of your leg to show immediately if you have a blood clot. If you're at home, you wanna call the doctor and they may possibly want you to come in if you experience any chest pain and or shortness of breath, again, let your nurse know right away. This could be a more serious complication where a blood clot could have moved from your leg to your lungs. In order to prevent blood clots, we will be taking lots of measures. You will be on a blood thinner, so make sure you're taking that as ordered. We want you to walk often to promote um, circulation you will also be wearing pneumatic stockings. And another thing you can do is those calf pumps where you're pumping your foot up and down. And again, that helps promote circulation through the leg. Another thing you can do is make sure to stay hydrated by drinking plenty of fluids. Another complication is infection. Signs and symptoms of infection are when you have a persistent fever over 101 degrees. If you have any increase in redness around the incision site and or drainage, anything that isn't blood tinged or clear, if the drainage is any other color, that is something you would wanna let your nurse know or if you've been discharged to call your doctor and let them know. To help prevent infection, of course, the first measure would be washing your hands often, keeping the area around the incision clean and dry in the hospital, you're gonna be on antibiotics before surgery, during surgery, and for 24 hours after surgery. Another potential complication is pneumonia. We want you to cough and deep breathe often to help keep your lungs strong and also use the incentive spirometer. Dislocation is another rare complication. And to help prevent dislocation, you wanna practice 
the precautions specific to your surgery until cleared by your surgeon. When you're having a hip replacement, your doctor may do an incision on the posterior lateral aspect of your hip or on the anterior aspect of your hip. Um, depending on which approach the doctor has used, you will have something called hip precautions. If the hip precautions are on the lateral or posterior part of your leg, you will have to avoid hip adduction, hip internal rotation, and hip flexion greater than 90 degrees. If your doctor has done an anterior approach, which is an incision on the front of your leg, you will have to avoid hip hyperextension and hip external rotation. Knee precautions. There really are no knee precautions. Uh, there's things to do to enhance your recovery and to, and to make sure that you optimize the recovery. And one of those is never put a pillow underneath your knee. We want to promote knee extension and also make sure that when you're walking, you again accentuate knee extension when you're walking and you'll have the best outcome. We also want you to ice and elevate to control swelling. It's important to take time out of um, each and every day and elevate your leg above your heart and to ice and control swelling. That'll also help you maintain your range of motion and uh, decrease your pain. And then we want you to avoid jarring your knee and. Um, that seems rather obvious and you just want to avo avoid jarring activities. The goal is to get everyone home. When you go home, there are better outcomes and less chance of infection. If that's not safe, however, you may have to go to a skilled nursing facility or a rehab hospital for a short period of time. Um, when you do go home, you may have services ordered for you, like home physical therapy. This is the time if you have any friends or family that are willing to help you at home, take advantage of that. Living with your new joint, keep moving. A moving joint is a happy joint. We don't want you sitting in one spot for longer than 30 to 45 minutes. If, if you need to rest, it's preferred that you lay down and elevate the surgical leg. Follow your hip precautions. Keep your follow-up appointments. Usually the surgeon wants to see you about two to three weeks after surgery. This is where they will remove the outer sutures or staples. Do not drive until cleared by your doctor and you also must not be taking any narcotics. Activity, you can expect to get back to almost anything except constant running. Sexual activity, the surgeons like you to wait six weeks to resume, keeping your precautions in mind. Thank you all for attending. We hope this prepares you for your surgery and we look forward to seeing you soon.